to uh, shattering this a uh, program note before we return to uh, Yah's Torah testimony. Tomorrow uh, evening at uh, sundown, an argument actually could be made for this evening at sundown, uh, and some might even choose uh, Saturday evening at uh, sundown, is uh, the celebration of the Mikra of Teruah. Uh, a Mikra is a invitation from Yahweh, from God to be called out, which means to distance yourself from religious and political establishments, from economic schemes and military adventurism, to be called out of the world of human institutions and to be called and set apart unto him and his covenant. So it is an invitation from God himself to be called out and where you are invited to meet with God. So that is the purpose of, uh, of Teruah, uh, or any one of these mikraves, the plural of uh, mikra. It's an invitation to be called out and meet with God. Teruah um, is, a, uh, is uh, the, the fifth of the seven uh, moed mikra. Moed being meeting mikra I've just explained. Uh, it's the fifth of seven. The first four were fulfilled by uh, Yahusha, which means that he enabled the promises that Yahweh uh, made regarding those first four. Let me explain what the first four are, because the fifth one has no merit, has no value, has no purpose apart from the enablement of the first four. Uh, first, we have uh, Pesach Passover. Uh, Pesach Passover is the doorway to life. Uh, we were given mortal existence, mortal life by God. That mortal life, though, is, uh, is uh, very short by eternal standards. Doesn't uh, Almost no one lives past about 110 years. The average life expectancy is, uh, is closer to uh, 60 to 70 years, uh, maybe 75 in the, uh, in the West. But you're mortal. At the end of your mortal existence, if you have not availed yourself of Passover, your soul will cease to exist. The doorway to eternal life is Passover. It is only achieved by observing Passover. The means to being redeemed, cleansed of sin, occurs the next day after Passover, which is matzah. It means uh, unyeasted bread. Yeast is a fungus. It is. It permeates everything that uh, that it grows within, and yeast, according to Yahusha, uh, is the symbol of religious and political corruption. He explained that uh, during uh, his uh, cruise across the uh, Sea of Galilee with his disciples, telling them expressly what the yeast represents that is being removed from the loaf on matzah. The only means that Yahweh has to uh, redeem us, to declare that we are innocent of sin, occurs on matzah. If you do not observe matzah, there is no means to vindication, no means to salvation apart from matzah. Now, before I move to the third of these four Moed Mikre that are the invitations that God has invited us to that, that form the heart of his Torah teaching, if you were to celebrate Passover, where Yosha fulfilled it by, uh, by being the Passover lamb on Passover, if you were to celebrate Passover and not observe and benefit from matzah, it's the worst of all possible circumstances. There is no penalty at the end of your mortal existence simply ceasing to exist. But if you were to celebrate Passover, if you were to actually know what happened on Passover and what Yosha did as the Passover lamb and capitalize upon it, but pay no attention whatsoever to matzah as Christians do, that is the worst possible outcome because you become immortal, but you are not resolved of your sin, therefore you would be eternally separated from God. That means you would spend your eternity in Sheol, which is like uh, an eternal existence in a black hole. That is a very bad outcome. So God has uh, Pesach, which is Passover, the doorway to life, and matzah, unyeasted bread, which is to remove sin from our souls as, as a coterminous event. Never celebrate one without the other. This leads then to Bokotam. 
Bukhodim in Hebrew means firstborn children. They see these, the purpose of these events is to enable God to adopt children into his covenant. And so, firstborn children is the celebration of our spiritual birth into the family of God as immortal, as perfect children of Yahweh. This then leads uh, seven Sabbaths later. Shabbat is the Hebrew word not only for seven, but for promise. So seven Sabbaths later, or the promise of seven, is when Yahweh empowers and enriches his children. He empowers us with his spirit, making us tenfold greater than we are, and he then enriches us with his teaching so that we can then celebrate not only our relationship with him, get to know him better, but then we are prepared to do as he has requested on this day that we'll be celebrating tomorrow at sundown, Teruah. So, Larry, I have uh, I hear you in the uh, the background there. Um, what uh, what is Teruah all about? What do we do on Teruah? How does the those first four steps, those first four Moed Mikre, prepare us to uh, celebrate Teruah? Well, we're already uh, adopted into the family. We've got eternal life. We're mm-hmm. resolved to sins, and we're empowered. Right. And Teruah, of course, also means trumpets, and uh, obviously right. it no longer shares any uh, any space on the religious uh, Jewish calendar, which is it was replaced by the Babylonian head of the year, Rosh Hashanah. I have a head of the year in the seventh months beyond me. But uh, trumpets, you know, they, uh, trumpets, they didn't they didn't make their way out of Babylon. They they did they, they uh, you know they they took Babylon with them as they returned to Israel. It was a great tragedy. But yes, the head of the Babylonian year was uh, in uh, uh, was coterminous with the celebration of Teruah. And since uh, uh, religious Jews don't understand the purpose of, of Passover, Matzah, Bukhodem, or uh, Shabuah, uh, they uh, changed Yah's instructions on celebrating Teruah, and they commemorate the head of the Babylonian pagan uh, calendar. Uh, you are absolutely correct. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, uh, the, the purpose, obviously, uh, is, is for us to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, we're trumpeting. Right. <laughs> we're trumpeting Yahweh's words. That's what Teruah means. And right. it's, it, it's, uh, it's sounding an alarm. Uh, right. It also uh, means great joy, doesn't it? And so, yeah. Yeah. We, the, uh, at, at this time, this is when Yahusha, and there's all this debate, is there a pre-tribulation rapture? Well, it's not a rapture, but it, but, but in Yahusha Yahu, he says that, uh, uh, in the Qumran scrolls, he says that the, these men and women will be gathered and taken away to a, right. to a safe place, and yeah. basically they're going to be, uh, with her, but meaning the Ruach, right. on his couches, on Yahweh's couches, uh, and we'll be traveling with them. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's uh, there, there's it's, also so few are taken that the world isn't even aware of what, what what's uh, what's happening. So that's correct. There's there's Not two uh, yeah there's two aspects of Teruah. Uh, you've uh, you've um, covered uh, both of them there. The uh, the first is that the the trumpet to be blown is a shofar. A shofar is a very specific kind of trumpet. is made of a ram's horn. The uh, the ram's horn, if you'll recall, the first letter of the uh, Hebrew alphabet depicts a ram's head with the ram's uh, horn. It is also the first letter in the title for God. Uh, it is also the first uh, letter in the title for God's favorite title, which is Ab Father. The uh, the ram's horn, of course, is the is symbolic of the doorway to eternal life, where the sacrificial lamb of God uh, uh, is sacrificed so that we might live. And so that is the symbolism of this particular ram's horn. It pays attention to, it draws our attention to everything that, that has transpired uh, and been set in motion through these seven invitations, four of which have already been fulfilled. And the reason that four of them have been fulfilled, and they were all f- fulfilled in the fourth millennia of human existence after we were booted from the garden, is that there are five uh, promises associated with the covenant. And those five 
promises are all enabled by the first four mikre. We become immortal, we become perfect, uh, we become adopted into God's family, we become empowered by his spirit, we become enriched by his teaching. Those first are all empowered and enabled, and they were enabled by Yahweh through Yahusha in the fourth millennia of human history in the year 3000. Can I add something here? Sure, uh, sure. Sure. Uh, I, I, I just I'd like to point out uh, something uh, to to people who have these continual debates on whether or not people suffer the the, the, the what the great calamity or what Yao Kan mm -hmm. called tribulation, right. or at least in Greek what is called tribulation. Yeah. It says here, uh, he shall, as the sacrificial lamb, gather together and receive the harvest. Collecting the standing grain. Yeah, and that's exactly. Comma. Mm -hmm. That's standing grain. You notice it's standing. Right. He will be the one who cuts the fruit of the grain from the chaff and glean yep. it from the valley of the dead and demonic spirits. Now, this is Qumran Scrolls, and it's Yasha or Isaiah 17.5. So we understand that there's yet another... Harvest. Uh, sort of mid-trib, if you will, harvest. This is what it says. Yet there will be those left behind. Yeah. Gleanings, as in striking, shakings, cuttings down of, of an olive tree. Two yeah. or three ripe olives from the top branch and four or five concealed in a rock enclosure. Mm -hmm. Bearing right. fruit and flourishing, declaring and discussing the authority and the message and the prophecy of Yahweh. Uh, the mighty one of Yisrael. Now, so obviously there's one taken group taken away, and it's standing gray, and yet there right. is another one. Later. And, and so also, second, yeah, second yeah. harvest. The second harvest, yeah, even, so even, even uh, that one is talking about olives, so it's a, de it's a decidedly different harvest, and it's a gleaning, which means it's a really small harvest, uh, as opposed to the slightly larger harvest that takes place amongst the standing grain. And, and in 57.1, he says the upright person will disappear, and no one will devote any thought to it. Faithful and loving men and women will gather, be gathered, removed, harvested, and received, while no one perceives what's happening for indeed from your presence the upright uh, will be gathered together and taken away from the evil calamity now if anybody wants to that's this is what tarua represents these are the trumpets being taken away yahweh sees well, has no well, interest larry, in larry we're going to have to we'll continue that after the uh, commercial break we'll be right back with the shattering this <laughs> Back to uh, Shattering Mist. Before um, we uh, we underscore the points that uh, Larry has uh, made by uh, quoting from Yahweh, and when you're quoting uh, uh, the prophet Yasha Yah, uh, Yasha Yah means uh, salvation is from Yahweh, uh, you're actually quoting Yahweh himself. So what he read to us was uh, Yahweh speaking directly to us about the fulfillment of of Teruah. But before we get to the fulfillment of Teruah, uh, uh, return to that, Larry. Uh, I do want to uh, to speak about the observation of Teruah from our perspective uh, in the uh, in the short term between now and the time that it is fulfilled. And we only have now uh, 13 potential fulfillments of Teruah between now and the beginning of the uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, as it's referred to in uh, in Hebrew. Between now and the time that we are actually harvested as the standing grain, and we'll return to that thought in a moment, it is our job to, uh, to blow the shofar, to blow the ram's horn, to signal a warning, and to alert people to, uh, to uh, Yahweh's message. That is the reason we have become empowered and enriched with his teaching as children of the covenant. And so if you want to know how to celebrate this, is as the beneficiaries of Pesach, Matzah, Bokodam, and Shabuah, we are asked to share with all who will listen that God has a seven-step path that leads to his home, that there's one way to reconciliation in our relationship, there's only one way to enter God's home, there's only one means to eternal life, there's only one means to salvation. And all of that is articulated during as part of these seven invitations to meet with God. That is the way. 
It is the only way. There is only one covenant. There is only one path. There is only one Torah. There is only one God. And so it is our job, our mission, and you know, God does not force us to accept this. Everything's based on free will. But it, God has given us this opportunity and the ability to tell all who would listen that we are now on the fifth of the uh, seven steps that God has provided to his home. And that if you do not avail yourself of these invitations, that upon the end of your mortal life, that will be it. You will cease to exist. That's it. You don't go to heaven. You don't go to hell. 99.999% of humanities will simply cease to exist upon their mortal demise. And God is telling us that. As a matter of fact, in the next of these uh, these seven steps, the sixth of them, he uh, invites us to come into the presence of the uh, maternal aspect of God's light. Uh, it would be the light of the set-apart spirit. And he says, if you don't, I just want to make it very clear, if you don't, you're not only going to be estranged from me, which means uh, damned, damned and, and estranged and forsaken, separated from me is all the same concept. You'll be estranged from me. You're not going to enter my company, but you're going to cease to exist. Your soul will cease to exist. He tells us all that same thing. Your soul will be annihilated. Yeah, and he says the same thing uh, relative to matzah. You know, if you, if you don't observe, if you don't answer those invitations, your soul will cease to exist. Cease to exist means annihilated, gone, vaporized, nada, n no more. It just, and we know yeah. that Yahweh personally takes part in each of these uh, mikre, each of them. He right. takes per personally. He he walks that walk, as you're always saying. Right. Yes. You know, he's, this is a party that he has thrown for us, and he has invited us to attend. And if you want to have a relationship with him, if you want to be saved by him, then uh, you need to attend. Join in the relationship. Take part uh, in the relationship. Exactly. Exactly. So that's the that's the primary purpose of Terua, and has been, and will continue to be, uh, until sometime between probably 10 and 13 years from now when uh, that will no longer be the primary uh, purpose of uh, Terua. And that is because Terua is the first of the seven steps to God that has yet to be fulfilled. And it's going to be Can fulfilled. Can I ask you something here, Yada? Sure. Uh -huh. is, is this a holy day or is this a party day? Uh, there are no uh, holy days uh, with God. There are no Jewish holidays with God. Uh, every one of, of Yahweh's called out uh, uh, invitations to meet with him are chog. That means they're celebrations, they're parties. Uh, God likes festival feasts. His idea of a good time is exactly as he described it with the Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, is that he wants a protective uh, environment that's conducive to life like a home uh, that is sheltered the, of great joy and total satisfaction and so these meetings with him are about having a good time about celebrating life about celebrating relationships and every one of them is consistent in that way so as we talked uh, about what these seven steps mean with the seventh being camping out with God in his home which represents a return to the conditions at Eden it, it represents eternal life with uh, with God it represents the entire purpose of our creation we will return to that theme and speak of its fulfillment with Shattering Mist continues <laughs> To Shattering Mist, I'm your host Yada. We're talking with uh, Larry here about uh, the fifth of seven invitations that Yahweh has uh, invited us to meet with Him to celebrate each year. Uh, Larry, you went to the uh, uh, in your presentation two segments ago, uh, uh, actually reading what Yahweh had said to us regarding the purpose or the fulfillment of this event. And the first thing that you said is that uh, it is a harvest of uh, standing grain, that God himself, Yahweh, is going to engage to harvest standing grain. Now what I'd like our listeners to recognize is that the first month of the year, Abib, uh, which is the month of Passover, Matzah, and Bakotam, they all uh, take place on the, uh, the 14th, which is the 13th day at sunset, uh, the following in the next two days, uh, that Abib is the, uh, is the month of standing grain. 
and that the grain that is standing is barley, and that uh, barley is still ripe and, and receptive uh, when the, uh, the month begins, which means that God is saying, you know, I'm not going to deal with the chaff. I'm not going to deal with, with souls that are hardened and unreceptive to me. But if your grain is still growing and you're receptive and you're standing, which means you're not bowing down in a religious environment, then uh, you uh, are the, <laughs> have the opportunity to be the beneficiaries of the standing grain celebration, which is Abib and uh, revolves around Pesach, Passover, immortality, matzah, redemptions, uh, sinlessness, in other words, vindication, and Bokodam being uh, among the, f- the children born into the first family. That's all. That's the reference to the standing grain. So it's more than just God conceived this his covenant so that we could stand with him, walk with him, engage with him, have a grand old party and, and a wonderful time with him, and never bow down uh, before him. Uh, it is a direct reference to the Abib, the first month of the year, when uh, barley is standing and growing within the uh, the kernel. And so, well, that, he also points out, he yeah. says, the upright person will disappear, not the right. Mountain. Right, and the upright person is from Sadak. The uh, upright person is uh, is uh, also means righteousness and vindicated. From God's point of view, the upright are uh, righteous and vindicated. Dode, who uh, is called uh, righteous. We are made uh, righteous and upright by uh, by God because he lifts us up so that we are standing, uh, walking uh, with him just like uh, parents lift their children up so that they could walk to, uh, together. And the, the whole concept of Sadak righteousness and uprightness is uh, directly attributable to the second of the three steps or second of the three invitations to meet with God of Matzah, where we are made righteous just because sin is removed from us, which is the symbolism of unleavened or unyeasted bread. So, yes, he is, he is harvesting the standing grain, but he is not harvesting the chaff. And you made a comment that was uh, uh, from Yahweh uh, that was uh, particularly intriguing here, which is that according to Yahweh, this harvest will be so small that the world won't even notice it. You know, this Christian mythos of the rapture, which is from Pauline Doctrine, you know, has it being this big event and people all over the world Planes wondering. Crashing well, of course. And, uh, cars going down the road right. with no yeah. driver in them. And, uh, so yeah, and, God, and God says, you know, they, they, there will be so few people that uh, come to know me as who I am, that come to uh, embrace the terms and conditions of my covenant, and who uh, answer my invitations to meet with me. There will be so few. In fact, he says uh, thousands amongst billions, which is one in a million. There'll be so few that they won't even be noticed. Their disappearance won't even be noticed. Well, you know, I think we have to view these things and always have as, as, you know, there was one Noah saved in an entire region. There was one lot uh, saved yeah. out of an entire two. Well, it, well, you know, it's a little bit more than that. I mean, uh, Noah had a, uh, a family, eight including Noah, and, uh, and Lot, uh, and, you well, know, a lot. The whole region, though. Yeah, you know, it was, it was Lot's. Family. Right, yeah. Lot's, Lot's family as well. And But yeah. one family saved in both of those cases because God's in the business of saving families, and the family that he is saving is his covenant. It's the very family that he was talking to Abraham about uh, relative to, uh, so, to Sodom, uh, which is the covenant family. And there's only one Good covenant. Point. Uh, Good throughout point. The I end didn't of... catch that. You're right. Families. He's in the business of growing yeah. his family. Yeah, so those are families. Absolutely. Yeah. When, uh, when Yahweh went to, uh, to Egypt to, uh, to free uh, his people from uh, the religious and political oppression of Egypt, he referred to his people as his family. And they were called the children of Israel, and he used the Hebrew word am, which means family, that he was freeing from the uh, oppression of, of Israel, Israel. And he said, I'm doing it because of my commitment to the covenant, which is a family-oriented relationship with Abraham. God's only got one motivation, only one. And it isn't to save everyone. Only one motivation, and it isn't to be worshipped. He doesn't want to be worshipped. He has one motivation, only one reason he created the universe, and that is to build and nurture and protect and enjoy his family. That's it. 
You're either with God because you have come to know him and you've acted upon the terms and conditions of the covenant, or he does not know you and you do not know him, and at the end of your mortal existence, that will be it. And so to He's law, focused on relationship. He's not focused on running around saving everyone. Uh-uh. That's not the point. People have no. to accept those invitations. Yeah, if he was, so. yeah, if he was interested in, if he was interested in saving everyone, then yeah, he's a colossal flop. Because look at his uh, at the magnitude of his sacrifice on Pesach uh, and Matzah in year uh, 33 CE in our calendars, year 4000 Yah. Look at the magnitude of his sacrifice and consider how few people, maybe a hundred, availed themselves of what he did at that time. Yes. So, you know, he certainly isn't in the business of trying to uh, to save everyone. He is in the. Now, he, that's not to say that he would be opposed to everybody being saved. He he would love it if uh, if everyone was saved. But to be saved, you first have to embrace the terms and conditions of the covenant. It's only his children that are uh, are saved. And would he love it if everyone chose to be his child? Absolutely. But that just isn't the way. It has turned out. The, uh, we have a call, uh, Larry, from Diane, who's calling in from uh, Colorado. Hello, Diane. Welcome to Shattering Miss. Good morning, Ada. How are you? Wonderful. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really glad that you guys are talking about this uh, right now. I've been reading in Jeremiah and um, and several other places. I think it's in Proverbs or Psalms, and he's talking about that the wicked will be removed. Mm-hmm. Can you help me with that? Sure. There's uh, uh, it's uh, Yermaya. Uh, it means uh, Yahweh uplifts. Is the uh, the name of the uh, of the prophet that he uh, he speaks about. And uh, before we uh, we enter the millennial uh, Shabbat, the thousand year celebration of the of the seventh invitation, which is Sukkah, uh, which is in essence we return to the conditions of the Garden of Eden. For us to return to the Garden of Eden, every practitioner of politics and religion, of military uh, adventurism and of uh, economic calamity has to be removed from the earth. And so when Yahweh returns, he is returning less diminished. He's not returning undiminished, because if he would return undiminished, it would uh, incinerate our planet. But he is returning as light, and his return will instantly vaporize all of those who who are not uh, enveloped in his set-apart spirit, who have not availed themselves of, of his way and his covenant. And the reason they all have to be eliminated is because religion and politics and military adventurism and economic scheming are not allowed in his home. You know, it's the first requirement of the covenant is you have to be willing to walk away from those things, to disengage from them if you're going to come to trust and rely on Yahweh and walk to him and become perfect uh, and observing the terms and conditions of his covenant. And so... It's, uh, that is exactly what's going to happen. When he returns, he is not happy with humanity. You know, he's not coming back with a, with a giant smiley face. He's not coming back as the, uh, as this, uh, um, fellow that's going to be dressed in, uh, in pretty white robes and, uh, and is, uh, is going to just embrace all the little children of the world. When he comes back, man will be on the precipice of annihilating this planet. We engage in nuclear war. Our planet is all but destroyed by our own making. And he returns to eliminate everyone who is not his children. So that's, uh, that's what he means. What he's, he's going to remove the wicked. Now, those who have actually plotted against him and led uh, people away from him, now, he is, uh, he's going to have a, uh, a second um, removal process with them. They're not just going to get the benefit of, of being uh, annihilated, uh, Diane. Their souls are not going to cease to exist. Those uh, wicked, the ones that actually, by engaging in politics or uh, are engaging in religion or academia and misleading people, 
they are uh, going to be um, incarcerated. They'll be judged and incarcerated, set apart, removed, if you will, and put into Sheol, a black hole for all eternity. Do you, uh, is it possible, also in Jeremiah, he, he's talking about the festivals too, and he goes, I'm sick of your festivals and, mm-hmm. you know, all of that stuff. What festivals at that particular time was he speaking of? Do you, can you tell me? Yeah, they, he, said, he said, he didn't say that he was sick of his festivals, did he? No. No, what he said is, I'm sick of your festivals. And there's, it's a combination of two things. One is if you look at a, go to a Hebrew site on uh, Judaism, and you look up the uh, the annual calendar for uh, Judaism, and what you uh, find is that the vast majority of uh, Jewish festivals have nothing to do with Yahweh. For example, they celebrate Rosh Hashanah today as opposed to Teruah. They don't celebrate uh, Shavuah. They don't uh, celebrate Bukurim. Uh They uh, they celebrate Pesach and Matzah but in an entirely uh, erroneous way. They, uh, they celebrate them as strictly a, um, uh, a, uh, an enactment of uh, leaving Egypt as opposed to representing that what they're leaving is, is politics and religion. They, uh, they, they corrupt uh, Yom Kippurim uh, to make it a time where they afflict their souls when Yom Kippurim is all about Yahweh afflicting his soul uh, during matzah so that our souls wouldn't be afflicted. And so it's a combination of they uh, adopted the uh, pagan religious rites of the Babylonians and, uh, and of the uh, Egyptians and uh, of the Hittites. And so... By embracing them, they had many festivals that were purely pagan, and the few festivals of his that they celebrated, they had corrupted, and so God says, "Eh, I don't want any part of this anymore. Last segment. This is uh, Shattering Mist. We're talking about the uh, now fulfillment of uh, of Teruah. Um, God told us that He was going to harvest the standing grain, and we now recognize what the standing grain is. Why do you think that He is going to uh, harvest uh, the standing grain? Those who are um, blowing the shofar or trumpet uh, uh, prior to uh, the tribulation, Larry. Because Why do you think he's he... not demented and he doesn't see any point in people who already have a relationship with him and understand him the suffering. <laughs> exactly. Fact, what, he, what he says is those people, uh, they enter a place of salvation, complete and perfect peace, total satisfaction, the most favorable of all circumstances, and they are satisfied spiritually as their physical energy is restored while they relax on his couches. They travel with her. That would be our spiritual mother, right. the set apart spirit, the uh, Kodesh Ruach, upon his, uh, excuse me, upright, upright in his presence. Upright in his presence again. Right. We have upright all, right. all over the yeah. place. And the only place we're uh, not upright is we're uh, sitting right down beside him. So that and that's we, Quran scrolls, so that right. is the uh, that's right. stamp material. Right. That's so. again Yasha Yahu or Isaiah fifty seven two. So right. uh, obviously uh, Yahweh is not interested in seeing those who get the picture uh, uh, suffering. Right. <laughs> I, that's I, what, I don't that's know just, what demented deity right. would enjoy watching right. his family. He, he just yeah, he's just right back to uh, to family. He's father, and the reason that that sometime over the next thirteen uh, years that Yahweh's uh, covenant children will be uh, removed from this planet is that the last seven years on earth, as bad as things are now, the last seven years before his return are hellacious, the kinds of things that we that man does to his fellow man. And therefore God's saying, I'm going to remove my, uh, my children. Now, we will still leave a legacy. There will be like archives of this program, for example. There will be uh, ability to, uh, on various sites to read material where people have said, you know, here's what God said, this is what it means, let me put this in context for you. Uh, this is uh, what it's all about. And then he speaks of a gleaning, doesn't he, of, uh, of olives from a shaken tree. 
and yeah, so very small gleaning, and that's right. it, that's that's during that that seven year period of time of that great calamity or tribulation. Right. Period. So there are going to be people uh, who either turn directly to Yahweh's word themselves and begin to make sense uh, of it for themselves, or they turn to to material that uh, you and I are sharing, or they uh, uh, listen to archives of a program uh, like this. But during that seven years, there are going to be those that say, "Wait a minute." This has all been predicted. I remember hearing about that or reading about this. This was all predicted that this was going to happen. Maybe it's time that I, uh, I take seriously the testimony of the God who predicted this was going to happen and, uh, and see why it is that I was left behind. And the, those who are shaken by the events, which will be hellacious, those who are That's shaken by those events. going to be the vast, vast, vast majority of people. There's not going to be 50% of Christians or the good Christians who showed up to, you know, no, be no Christians. You every Sunday. Not a single there Christian. Be a Christian there because he finds religion an abomination, a disgusting abomination. He tells us not to imitate any form of it. Right. They certainly cannot stand worship. That's why you're upright in his presence. You're not groveling like a, right. like a, like right. a mental case. Yeah, in fact, if I can interrupt you, the, the, uh, the very festivals that Yahweh specifies in Yerma Yahu that he hates are the bringing in of cut down trees to celebrate the winter solstice and bringing them into the home and decorating them. He's, he's saying, you know, you're celebrating Christmas. I hate that. And then he, he speaks about the Asherah pole and the celebrations that uh, were the on the Sunday closest to the uh, vernal equinox, which is today's Easter. And he's saying, yeah, right. even, even, even in Israel, it's a Babel, those are all Babylonian holidays, religious holidays, and God is saying, I'm disgusted by uh, the celebration of those things. And as such, the Christians who gather in churches on, uh, on Sunday to uh, worship the, uh, their Lord, not a single one of them is going to be part of the standing grain harvest. Not one. Now, there will be a few during the, uh, the seven years that follow that are going to be shaken, and uh, and they're going to turn to Yahweh and say, oh my God, the God really does have a name, it's Yahweh, it's not Jesus Christ. He hates the title Lord, that's Satan's title. What did he actually say? Who is he really? And what is he inviting me to? What is he offering? And they'll discover the covenant, and they'll embrace it, and they'll meet with him on, the, on these uh, invitations, and they'll uh, ultimately be uh, gathered in and as a gleaning uh, by him. And then ultimately we'll celebrate on October 2nd as the sun sets in Jerusalem in uh, the year of 2033, year 6000 Yah. We will celebrate the ultimate reconciliation of Yisrael with Yehudim and them together with Yahweh five days before we return to Eden.